Welcome to Aging Insight with your host, John Ross and Lisa Schollmeyer. This program is brought to you by Heritage Home Health, Ameriprise Financial, Better Hearing Care, Windsor Cottage, Red River Federal Credit Union, Wadley Senior Clinic, Home Care Assistance, Hospice of Texarkana, Our Place Respite Care Center. Welcome to Aging Insight. I'm Lisa Schollmeyer and I'm here today with my co-host John Ross and we are here to give you information to help you as you age in our community to know about the resources and the legal and financial issues that you may encounter as you age or if you're a family caring for an aging or disabled individual we want to provide information to you so that you can uh, think about the kind of plans and the things you need to get in place to make sure you can care for that loved one in the way you want to. So, John, uh, today we had decided we were going to talk about an issue that affects older people and younger people, uh, particularly if those younger people have some special needs. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of times people think about this being a disabled or handicapped individual, but that's not necessarily the case, is it? Right. You know, one of the things that's, that's out there that we have a large percentage of the population that is disabled. Um, but just because some people aren't disabled doesn't mean that they can't become disabled. You know, so often people have a tendency to plan for today. And they look and they say, well, you know, it's me and my wife and we're healthy and we're getting ready to retire and we've got all these big plans. And when we die, we want everything to go to our three beautiful, healthy adult children that have no problems and everything's great. And that's because everything's great right now. But, you know, when you're talking about planning for the future, you know, if everything goes great, you don't need to plan. That's not the purpose. <laughs> the whole purpose of planning is so that if things go wrong, you've got the things in place to protect those loved ones. And so one of the things we're going to be talking about today is probably one of the most powerful, one of the most important types of, of estate planning tools that's out there is something called a special needs trust, uh, also called a supplemental needs trust. And that's what we're going to be talking about today, what it is, how you use it, and why it's so important that every single estate plan out there ought to have it in there. We did, that's right, John. Uh, you know, the idea of a supplemental or a special needs trust being contained in every single uh, will or estate plan is, you know, something that, that we encountered some years ago as the profession was talking about things like the, the simple will, you know, as a, as a wife, I leave everything to my husband if he survives me, and then if he hasn't, if he's already deceased, everything equally to my children. And, and you know, basically, years ago, the profession was already saying that that was essentially malpractice. Yeah, it's just not enough. Because, again, while you may want everything to go to that spouse, you may want everything to go to those kids. Well, let me ask you, what happens if at the time of your death and you're leaving assets to these kids, what happens if one of those kids has become disabled and they're in a nursing home? You know, so often we think about the older uh, generation being the one that has problems. But, you know, that's not always the case. We've had situations where our clients have had a child who was in a car wreck and has a head injury, or they developed uh, uh, some sort of disease or Parkinson's or early onset Alzheimer's. You know, or maybe, you know, just in some cases, we've had where the older generation just lives a long, long time. And, you know, one of the, one of the funny things about it is if you, get, uh, if you get into 80, 90, 100, over 100, you know, if you're, if you're 100 years old, my guess is your children are not young. You know, they, they're easily in their 80s as well. And so we want to plan and make sure because my guess is that you don't want to leave your assets to the nursing home. You want to leave them for the benefit 
of that child. And that's where the special needs trust planning comes in. So, so Lisa, tell us, what, does, what is it that a special needs trust does? Well, essentially, we're talking about someone uh, as a beneficiary if that person is disabled. And we could be talking about a, a spouse with, with Alzheimer's who is either uh, needs uh, long-term care now or will likely need that type of care in the future. Or we could be talking about a child, uh, even if that child is living in the community, but because of their disability, they receive uh, certain government benefits that help support them in their disability to remain as independent as possible in the community, which is, of course, what every parent wants, uh, particularly for that disabled uh, child. So we're talking about an estate planning tool that will preserve the benefits that that disabled individual might be receiving. And often those benefits are so critical because not only are those benefits perhaps paying for nursing home care if, if they're in an institutional setting or some housing assistance, uh, you know, uh, additional assets to pay for the cost of living. Uh, more importantly, a lot of times these benefits are also providing the health care that that disabled individual is able to obtain, whether it's Medicaid, uh, medical insurance, or whether it's Medicare. So those benefits are critical to that person's well-being, and we want to preserve them. And John, talk to our viewers about what the risk is if we just leave assets outright to these disabled individuals. Right, so if you've got, let's say you've got a family member, maybe it's an adult disabled child that has Down syndrome or Parkinson's uh, or cerebral palsy or something like that, or maybe it's, uh, maybe it's some other family member, maybe it's even your, your husband or your wife who, who has these diseases, that person either now or at some point in time in the future could be eligible for government benefits that are based on their financial need. In other words, they have to have very low income or and they have to have very low assets. And so if you were to, uh, let's say I had a child with Down syndrome and that child relied on Medicaid and SSI for their basic care and I were to leave this child some money directly those benefits would immediately be lost because they would have too much in assets in order to qualify. But you know, that's not what I intended to do. I, what I intended, what I, I want to leave assets for the benefit of that person, but I want them to be able to keep those government programs, the Medicaid, the SSI, without having to use up what I've left them. I want my stuff to provide quality of life. And that's not something that the government pays for. Right. You know, and, and this is not a situation where we're talking about, you know, we're, we're encouraging people to, you know, jump on uh, government benefits. You know, these are situations where we truly have a disabled individual due to their age or due to an inherent disability uh, where, you know, these folks are either, you know, not able to have a productive uh, job and, and lifestyle or, you know, they're aged past the point where they can do those things. So, you know, when, we're going to take a little break right now, but when we come back, we're going to get into the, the details of how you can leave assets and plan and provide for that disabled uh, person, but yet still make sure you preserve their basic access to these benefits they may be receiving. Hi there, I'm Larry Sims. It's been my privilege for the past several years to be a volunteer board member of Hospice of Texarkana. And there I'm able to represent community members like you. We continually customize our end of life care to better meet the needs of our community. As an example, our medical director and nurse practitioner still make visits to homes and facilities. Call today to learn more about the help we can give your family. Hospice of Texarkana, the nonprofit hospice established in 1985 for the community by the community. As things get older, they require more care. This car and I have seen a lot of miles together, but because I take care of her, she runs just like she did in 1955. 
That's why I chose the Wadley Senior Clinic with an individualized care plan designed just for me and a convenient location off Jefferson Avenue. They have everything to keep me running like new. It's not about the miles, it's about the journey. Let the Wadley Senior Clinic keep you happy, healthy, and cruising down the road of life. Our children were the first to notice that my husband needed in-home care. Being his full-time caregiver was becoming very difficult for me, physically and emotionally. And we would never dream of moving him outside our home of 40 years. That's when we called Home Care Assistance. With Home Care Assistance, I know I can reach a care manager 24 hours a day. Schedule your free in-home assessment at one 4 live in Welcome back to Aging Insight. I'm Lisa Schollmeyer here today with John Ross. And today we're talking about uh, providing for those people in our families that are least able to provide and protect themselves, and that is the disabled. Whether that disability be from age, or whether that disability be from a disease, or inherent uh, you know, uh, birth defect, or those type of issues, but it's just imperative that our uh, families make a plan for these type of individuals, and one of the ways we can do that is to set aside assets for those individuals for their use that will improve their quality of life after we are gone. And, and John, that is something called a supplemental needs trust, also called a special needs trust. And there are two types of those type of trusts. Is that That's correct? That's right. That's right. So the first thing is, is we're talking about a trust. And all a trust is, is a stack of paper. But once this trust is created, it's a legal entity and it's got rules and it's governed by the words that are in that trust. And the way a supplemental needs trust works is that the assets are held for the benefit of that disabled person, but they're held in such a way that they don't affect their eligibility for Medicaid or SSI or other government programs. Now, as Lisa said, there's actually two types. One of them is what's called a third party special needs trust. Now, what does all of that mean? Well, all that means is this is a special needs trust that's set up by one person for somebody else. So imagine that my spouse had Alzheimer's disease. And, you know, as long as I'm alive, I'm going to care for her and I'm going to take care of her. But, you know, with Alzheimer's disease, the life expectancy of the spouse of the person with the disease is shorter than the person with the disease. It's so hard being that caregiver that a lot of times the caregiver dies first. And without that caregiver, that means that that, that wife that I was trying to take care of might now need to go into a nursing home. Well, when I die, let's say I had just left everything to the wife. Well, now all of those assets are gonna get eaten up by the cost of the nursing home care before she would become eligible for Medicaid. But you know what Medicaid pays for? It's room and board, but it's not quality of life. It's not new clothes, it's not going to the movies. So if my wife was disabled and she was gonna need some of those cares, I would set up a third party special needs trust so that when I die, those assets could be held for her but it would not count against her when she needed to qualify for something like Medicaid. So that's a third party. It's set up by one person for somebody else. Well, you know, and one of the examples I see a lot that we deal with is grandparents who were, you know, perhaps uh, I had a lady come in and she wanted to leave uh, $10,000 a piece to each of her five grandchildren. And I asked her if any of these grandchildren had any disabilities. And the uh, grandmother said, well, yes, as a matter of fact, I have one grandchild who has moderate to severe autism. And, you know, at that point I suggested that, you know, for that particular grandchild's uh, benefit, that she set up this third party special needs trust where she was gonna put the money that she wanted to leave to that grandchild, she'd leave that set aside in a trust for that grandchild so that that money could be used to provide, you know, the special things that this uh, child, as he grew and developed, you know, grew to like and brought him comfort and joy. And you know, 
John, if I hadn't asked that question, then the funds that that grandmother had, if she had gone to someone else who hadn't set up that, that special needs trust, then that grandchild would have been disqualified from any of his benefits he may have been receiving at the time of her death, and her money would have gone to pay for those basic services that that young man was receiving instead of being set aside to make sure that he uh, got the, the special walkers and, and the special uh, computers that he needed in order to best communicate with his family. And that, you know, that's what, the, that's what this grandmother wanted to do. So that third party special needs trust is a way for others to leave assets for the benefit of that, um, of that special person. Right, now the one thing about it is there's also a situation where, you know, imagine that instead of me wanting to set it up for somebody else, what if I had become disabled and I had some of my own funds that I wanted to protect so that I could qualify for things like Medicaid and still have my own personal funds available to me to provide my own quality of life. So now I want to use my assets to provide for my quality of life and still have access to things like Medicaid and SSI. You know, a lot of times we see this in, in situations where maybe the person has been in a, a very bad car wreck where they've received a head injury and now they're going to be getting some, some personal injury settlement. Or maybe it's a disabled person who you know, their grandparent hadn't gone and seen Lisa. And that grandparent passed away. And so here this disabled person has inherited some money and the receipt of that inheritance has caused them to lose their benefits. So how do they protect those assets and still keep them? Well, if you're under the age of 65, notice under the age of 65, then you can set up, set up what is called a first party special needs trust. So third party, setting it up for somebody else. First party, setting it up for yourself. And this can be a way to preserve the assets that you have uh, so that you can get the benefits you need and still have some quality of life. But again, notice I said it has to be something that's set up prior to the age of 65. And that's not something that we came up with. It's built into the law. So First party special needs trusts are actually governed by federal law. These are provided for in the law as a way for people to protect themselves, but that law says you've got to do it prior to the age of 65. So we're going to take another break here in, here in just a second. But you know, when we opened this show, we talked about how these special needs trusts are so important, they ought to be in everybody's planning. Well. What we're going to talk about when we come back is what we mean by that. So we'll see you in just a second. Windsor Cottage offers a home environment with available assistance. Our mission is to provide ultimate care through dedication and personal attention. Residents enjoy the opportunity to continue their independent lifestyle with dignity. They thrive as they're able to live without the pressures of the hustle and bustle of daily living. Windsor Cottage is committed to a family atmosphere where residents can enjoy companionship and the pleasures of daily activities. At Windsor Cottage, we live the difference. Hi, I'm Blake Rich. Heritage Home Health and Heritage Hospice is a realization of my dream of bringing exceptional home care to the people of Texarkana, Texas and the surrounding areas. The love and compassion of Jesus Christ gives our work purpose. Their dignity is important to us. We respect the fact that they choose us and honor to be given that opportunity. Love, dignity, respect. We are Heritage Home Health and Hospice. Welcome back to Aging Inside, everybody. I'm your host, John Ross, here with my co-host, Lisa Schollmeyer. Today's topic, we're discussing special needs trusts, also known as supplemental needs trusts. And what these are, are a way that you can uh, have assets held for the benefit of a disabled person, but in such a way so that that disabled person can still be eligible for things like 
Medicaid, SSI, or other need-based government benefits. And those benefits can be vital to their basic care. You know, kind of like when I was in the Marines, you know, the, the drill instructors used to say, John, we don't know what you're complaining about. You got three hots and a cot. Well, you know, that's kind of what these government programs provide, basic care. They don't provide quality of life. It's up to you to provide that quality of life for that loved one, whether that's your spouse, whether that's your child or grandchild or anybody. Now, you might be thinking, you know what? I don't have any disabled members in my family. Everybody is perfectly healthy. My wife's healthy, my husband's healthy, our kids are healthy, our grandkids are healthy, everybody's healthy. Well, you know, that's great now. Yeah, it's, it's really a blessing, uh, but, you know, uh, unfortunately, you know, odds are that whether it's an aging process with you and your spouse where, you know, someone has a sudden health crisis such as a stroke or perhaps, say, diagnosed with a progressive disease like Parkinson's or Alzheimer's, dementia, you know, oftentimes, you know, that, that health this can be such a fleeting uh, asset and you know we need to plan for the potential that either you your spouse or one of your family members or loved ones who you intend to share uh, your assets with at some point we need to plan for the potential of a disability somewhere in the process that's right and so here's where we get the concept of the contingent special needs trust well that sounds all fancy and everything, it's not. So imagine that we looked at a will and, and let's say it's my will and my will says, I leave everything to my spouse and, and if she's not alive at my death, I leave everything to the kids. And you know what, I bet if you have a will, your will looks pretty similar. I leave everything to the spouse and when we're both gone, we leave everything to the kids. That's what I like to call an I love you will. Uh, it's great, there's nothing wrong with that. but. Let me add a little something here. What if it said, I leave everything to my spouse, comma, but if at the time of my death, my spouse is a disabled person, then instead of going directly to him or her, I want it to be held in a special needs trust for their benefit. And then when they die, that trust terminates and goes to our kids in equal shares, comma, but if one of those kids has become disabled, their share could be held for their benefit in such a way that they get to keep their benefits. And so you know what I've done here? If I die, everything goes to my wife. But if we're in a car wreck or something and I'm dead and she's got a head injury, then instead of leaving it directly, it gets directed over, it gets shifted over. And same thing when we go to the kids, we've protected those people with this contingency plan. Right, and so a contingency plan, you know, John, when you say it, it sounds so logical, so reasonable, so appropriate. And it really is, because if you think about it in the, in the simple will situation where you don't have the contingent special needs planning, you're really kind of rolling the dice and assuming that everything is going to stay in your happily ever after, uh, you know, fairy tale that you're living right now. And that's just not uh, usually the case, unfortunately. So, you know, it's a, it's a simple thing to do, but... Uh, you know, one of the one of the complaints I've had uh, when I've presented this uh, this special this contingent special needs planning to uh, someone in the community has been, well, you know that that overly complicates my situation. Oh yeah. You know, I, I don't like all that. It makes the will too long. You know, there's a lot of legal mumbo jumbo in there, and I, I don't like complicated things. I just want to keep it simple, and you know, I. I and then I usually can tell them a story about a family who had that, that simple uh, tool of planning, and it was such a crisis. You know, we're already dealing with the emotional crisis of losing a family member, but then when you find out that it's going to turn into a financial crisis 
for a disabled individual and the process to reestablish those benefits that they're receiving can be months and months long. You know, a few extra words and a little more complication in your will is so worth avoiding those other disasters. Well, and you know, I'll clear that up. Uh, I'll clear up that same issue. You have people all the time talk about wanting a, a simple will. You know, it's not the document that you want to be simple. It's the process. It's the transition between one life and the next. It's passing those assets in the easiest, most convenient, and most protected way. You don't care whether the document is simple or complex. You only care about whether or not it does the job. And so don't get fixated on you know, well, I just want, I want you to stick all that on one page. You know, how many pages it is is irrelevant. What's important is that it says what it needs to say. And one of those things it needs to say is that if somebody that you're leaving assets to is disabled, that their share will be held for their benefit. A contingent special needs trust, this is not an option. This is mandatory in your will. And if you don't have it, you need to be asking questions and saying, why isn't it in there? Because it really is that important. That's right. You know, and the special needs trust, those monies that you set aside for that disabled family member can be so vital to their quality of life. You know, our technology has progressed so quickly and, you know, the money you have set aside for that person can purchase things like iPads so they can FaceTime and, and visit with other family members through that technology. Um, they can have higher use wheelchairs that are easier to operate. Uh, you know, there's just pre special pressure mattresses that make their, their lives more comfortable as they're, if they're bedridden. There's just all kinds of things that your resources can do for a disabled person if you plan appropriately. That's right. So if you don't have a will in place or a trust in place, when you go and speak to a professional, ask them about contingent special needs planning. If you do have those things in place, look back at them and make sure that stuff is there. It's that important. But once again, you're here at the end of another episode of Aging Insight. We certainly appreciate you joining us. Please follow us on Facebook at facebook.com backslash aging insight or follow me on Twitter at TXK Elder Law. And, of course, you can always catch us on the radio. Every Saturday uh, afternoon at noon on 1071 live call-in program. So if you have a personal question that today's episode has sparked, well, then you just pick up the phone and, and give us a call or leave us a note on our Facebook page. That's right. So thanks, everybody, for watching. Listen in on the radio, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us for this week's Aging Insight program with John Ross and Lisa Schollmeyer. This program is made possible by Heritage Home Health, Ameriprise Financial, Better Hearing Care, Windsor Cottage, Red River Federal Credit Union, Wadley Senior Clinic, Home Care Assistance, Hospice of Texarkana, Our Place Respite Care Center,